Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, I re I'm, uh, I'm really happy for the invitation to uh, come here and be amongst um, uh, friends again. I'm going to uh, uh, try a new way of, uh, of presenting, and so uh, you can let me know uh, if this is a terrible failure or not. So one of the things that uh, started my interest in the use of object analysis was I was standing in line at the passport office. And the woman in front of me had blue hair, like blue like a smurf. And the passport agent was said, I'm not going to put blue on your passport. And she said, is my hair not blue? And he said, sure. And she said, well. And he said, I'm still not putting it down. And she said, are you going to ask all of these women here whether they color their hair? And he said, no, but I'm still not putting blue. <laughs> now, when I first thought about this, I thought that this was representative of her anxiety that the object of her passport would not relate what was obviously true about her. But the more I think about it, the more I realize that there's also an anxiety by the passport agent, saying that if he puts down something as paramountly ridiculous as blue, then that undermines the authority of the document itself. And it seemed to me that that moment of the document, the moment of having to fix brown hair versus red hair versus blue hair, that that was a moment that really brought into what an assemblage, into conjunction, a bunch of different ideas about subject, about identity, about mutability, about the body, about documents, about authority, about the discretion, about decision making. And that really led me down um, uh, this path towards uh, actor network theory and uh, uh, other forms of material analysis. So what I want to do today is I want to talk about two things. One, I want to talk about method, and the second, I want to talk about pedagogy, how we do surveillance, and then secondly, how we teach surveillance. Now, um, uh, part of my reflection comes from a recent book that I edited with um, uh, my uh, colleague, Jen Mutlu, uh, called Research Methods in Critical Security Studies, in which we assembled uh, 30, 40 of uh, the people doing work in critical security studies and said, so, what do you do? How did you do it? How did it go well? How did it go wrong? Now, one of the interesting things, uh, uh, last night when David said, we're all critical, everyone said yes, and then we moved on. And that was sort of really interesting to me because when we were at this critical security studies, I said, we're all critical, and there was uh, lots of hands up. Well, what do you mean by critical? And there was a sense, there was a concern that applying the name critical could have the potential to be a disciplinary tool. I'm critical, but what you do isn't critical. Mm -hmm. And so we, so we had a very rich and robust, long conversation about what we thought criticality was in this terms. And so we came up with this sort of, um, uh, these kind of four principles that worked for us at the moment. One was that, uh, um, uh, that the world is messy, and so rather, we shouldn't expect it to be structured, and we shouldn't expect it to be obvious. The second is that agency is multiple and distributed, that different things have agencies, and so we should be open to that. The third was that causality is not efficient, meaning that we're not looking for necessary and sufficient causes for A to always lead in the presence of B to C, but rather that particular things happen that were unexpected, mm -hmm. that you could put together all of the things that were necessary once, and it might not happen again. And that's, again, a reflection of the messiness. And then um, uh, fourth, and that's something that I think, I'm sorry, I think that's, that's a, um, uh, made a, sorry, I think that's better. Um, I'm seeing something different on the screen than you're seeing on the big screen. I apologize. So now I know that failed. So um, <laughs> um, uh, something that I think that surveillance studies does really well, that it frankly could teach a and and frankly could teach critical security studies, is that writing is always inherently political. That writing and research and presentation is always inherently political, and that we should sort of uh, own up to that. So what we did was, um, uh, in addition to trying to generate some uh, larger questions about uh, how we put together all of these different methods and approaches, we came up with a number of what we called modes. So we sort of said that there was an ethnographic mode in critical security studies, a discursive mode, a practice mode using mostly uh, field analysis, a corporeal mode to take in to account embodied approaches and those that used uh, affect, and then finally uh, the material mode. And so I you know, go from material to, um, uh, to actor network theory. 
That's not to say that actor network theory is the only way to do it. Science and technology studies have multiple different theoretical patterns, and there's also other veins within uh, mater new materialism. However, I'm just going to use ANT, actor network theory, as a kind of, of uh, starting point. So um, uh, within actor network theory, um, uh, following the work of um, uh, Bruno Latour, or John Law, and Marie Mall, um, and Michel Cadon, and others, there's a, um, an idea that when um, uh, Latour and Woolgar looked at the Salk Institute and they looked at how science happened, they said, we can't really separate the science and the culture. That those two things, that the objective and the, uh, and the social, were always mutually imbricated. And so why do we have an approach where we take the social as sort of one set and the technical and the scientific as another? Rather, we should have an approach that is uh, flatter or more anthropological. What we should do is we should go into the field and see what happens. Rather than going in and say, like I don't want to pick on sociologists because I know I'm outnumbered, but rather than go in and say, oh, I've got this thing called society and uh, I'm going to find it, so what we do is we go in and we say, what's happening in order for this particular assemblage to occur, for these particular disparate elements to come into contact with one another and to interact? And so, I mean, uh, I find that in my own work uh, on the passport in particular, that that's been a real sort of useful evolution for me. Because before, when I was looking just at discourse, I had that blue-haired lady, and I could do things with it, but I was always missing the power of the object. I was saying, well, it's the form or it's the idea that the agent has that creates that. And the moment that I read Latour, I said, I now I've got a much better way of telling that story. That it's the object of the passport and the things that assemble to create that opportunity that sort of enroll those different actors in different ways, create that anxiety and sort of illustrate that uh, those workings of power. So, um, uh, so actor network theory does a bunch of interesting things, but I think one of the things that surveillance studies, uh, well, I, I know that we keep referring to this mythical chimera called surveillance studies. One of the things that scholars in surveillance studies who identify themselves with surveillance studies <laughs> do so well is that, uh, is that uh, they are explicitly engaged with the civil libertarian, with the um, human rights, with the political aspect of the assemblage that they identify. And for myself, I find that in some of the workings by Latour or by Callan or by Law, there's less of that specific engagement. One of the things that I find when I read that is this incredibly compelling story about how this one aircraft sort of could be represented in all these different ways, and it's the conglomeration of all these different systems. But when I say, OK, so now how do I intervene in that system so that we can do something that we would view as positive or that I can identify with that value, then I'm left a bit, well, I don't know what to do. Now, um, uh, like David, I was, at that, um, uh, I was at that aviation security conference too, and um, uh, I feel like I was spe spectacularly unsuccessful in framing my language in a way that could communicate to that audience. Spectacularly. <laughs> I gave a presentation to the Aviation Security World Conference. Big amphitheater, 300 people. I like went to Sydney to do it. And I said, OK, here's, you know, I'm a security scholar. So I said, OK, aviation security, here are the false positives. Here are the things that happen on planes that cause security incidents. Everyone's drinking. Obviously, it's air rage, obviously, and then it's people making jokes. I said, so what we do, because you know, like I believe, you know, like that what we should maybe reduce those false positives, that decreases the cost, that also decreases the climate of fear, is that you tell the passengers honestly, you say, We value your security, please don't joke about terror threats. Like, to me, that, that fits everybody, right? Like that makes that that enrolls people in their sense of the insecurity. It you know gives them a sense of empowerment, gives them a sense of responsibility. It also decreases the number of false positives. I said this would be great. So I gave the presentation, and some guy came up to me afterwards, head of security for Air Canada, and he said, "Mark, that's a great idea." I said, "Thanks. I tried really hard. I did math. You know, like I really thought about this, and I've been a value based." Policy recommendation. He said, you know we're never going to do that. And I said, well, OK, why? And he said, well, because 
the safety announcement has to be given while, uh, after the plane is detached from the airport, but before it gets on the runway. And so to the airline, that's nothing but dead time, because the engine's got to be running, but they're not moving. So he says that costs more than almost any other bit, except for the takeoff. So no airline will accept the sort of an increase in the length of the safety announcement. <laughs> now, again, like so, uh, so the actor network theory really gives you a good view to looking at that. You say, okay, so why does this policy idea enroll or get traction? And the answer is that it doesn't for all these interesting political, economic, and regulatory reasons. But then what was even more striking to me was that no one seemed to, my social capital in that field did not diminish as a result of my having this bad idea. Everyone said, good idea, well presented, never going to happen. Why don't you come to our next meeting? <laughs> <laughs> and that's not the way I expected it to go. I expected me, to, you know, I expected it to say, you are an idiot, you had a bad idea, and we're, you're not going to get published, and you're never going to come to our meetings again. But it was, quite the, uh, it was quite the opposite. And that led me to think that there's something else going on, not just in the way that knowledge and authority, but in the way that those social, that social capital gets translated. Now, I want to move from my particular failure to sort of, you know, like general cases of failure, in particular teaching. Because <laughs> it seems to me that one of the things that we do, uh, that we constantly struggle with, is to translate the ideas that we work on in our room to the other, the other humans, right? To uh, other people. And the teaching is both lovely in that it gives us the opportunity to test out our ideas with, to people who are, if not interested, then at least present, <laughs> and who don't have the jargon of the background that we do. So we come and we've thought about this hard and we've mapped it all out, and then we present it to people who, you know, are critical listeners. Let's, um, uh, let's say that. <laughs> Now, one of the things that um, uh, I find, um, uh, both when I teach and in reading um, uh, the literature on, ped uh, on pedagogy, is that the sage on the stage doesn't work. Of course, we know that you know, trying to information dump into empty jugs of water never happens. So what do we do? We try to figure out ways to empower students to learn themselves. And one of the best models for doing this is problem-based learning. So rather than give a preset structure and say, boom, I'm going to tell you about the history of surveillance, or I'm going to tell you about the history of globalization, what, they, what you do is you set a, a series of problems. And then you say, you are going to get into groups, and I'm going to help you, you find the answer. Uh, this came in part from, uh, I was in my big, you know, like introduction to globalization class, you know, it's 250 <laughs> people, you got to do, you know, like a big show, and they made the joke about the Battle of Hastings, as you do. <laughs> See, now look, now look, now you laughed, the 218 year olds did not laugh, but two minutes later they did, and there's a little ripple here, and there's a little ripple there, and I said, okay, so what's going on? So finally someone put up their hand, and they said, well, no one got the Battle of Hastings joke, but so-and-so Googled it and found it on Wikipedia, then they posted it to the class Facebook page, and of course I'm looking at Facebook, and so I got, I got the message. And I really thought to myself, wow, you know, like, I am not the filter for information anymore in the way that I used to think I was as a professor, that I could take all the infinite amount of data, put together the interesting bits and a good story. But now I needed to do something different. And so what I um, uh, do in my uh, Intro to Globalization course, let's see if this uh, works a bit better, is I do problem-based learning. So I present them with a series of problems, coffee, trash, uh, cotton, you know, surveillance in, is in fact one of them. And I say, here's the problem. We're going to look at it from a bunch of different perspectives, and we together are going to discover how this is a problem, where the power is, and then what should we do about it. So, you know, like you get epistemology, politics, and then ethics built, sort of baked into uh, to each problem. So, um, uh, so one of the, uh, so the principles of problem-based learning are that you present a problem, that you facilitate the discovery of the answer rather than giving the answer. So rather than say, coffee's uh, the problem of the World Bank, you know, it's about structural adjustment programs and export-led growth and the development of, uh, you know, like of elite consumption. You say, so what, do we, what, what can we know about coffee? And then you draw out the different 
bits of information that they can gather, and then you let the students facilitate the conversation. It's been fascinating because each group is different. And each group comes up with the same, like if we can say that there's one story, they each came up with that story from different perspectives in different ways. And so that makes it incredibly invigorating, both as a student, because they get a real sense of ownership. They said, we did this together. But also it's exciting for me, because there's a bit of that you know, panic of, what if they come up with something that I don't know? Or, well, I'm sorry, that's always the case. But they say, you know, like, what if they put it together in a way that I don't immediately get? You know, or, you know, like, it, it, it means that you have to give up a certain amount of uh, control. Am I at two minutes? Is that the nope. thing? Okay. <laughs> so um, uh, so uh, teachers are then facilitators. They are co-learners. You say, we together are going to find out about so, uh, uh, another example, bees and colony collapse disorder. I had no interest in bees. I have no interest. I don't like honey, you know, and, you know, but one of my students was an apiarist and came in and said, my bees have all died. And I said, we've got a week. Why don't we look at that? And so we looked at colony collapse disorder, and then that got us to you know, like industrial agriculture, which got us to monoculture, which got us to the EU, and got us to regulation, and got us to pesticides. And so you can say from all that, look, right, you know, so now what do bees mean? Well, it's a story about complexity, it's a story about unintended consequences, and I never, I didn't know anything about bees when I started out, but by the end of the week, then we'd really had an engaging, interesting, and totally novel way of looking at this particular problem. So, um, uh, so what I want to suggest is that in the um, uh, teaching of surveillance studies, that there's a way to bring these two together, that surveillance studies is almost uniquely situated for. And that is problem-based learning through objects, in particular through those technological artifacts that make this particular configuration of surveillance possible. And so one could look at CCTV cameras, or one could look at the, um, uh, the UID uh, um, uh, program or biometrics, that there's a real way to present the technologies, the objects, the assemblages of surveillance using this toolkit in a way that becomes pedagogically really, I think, uh, really incredibly productive. And so um, uh, I, I think I've got two and a bit minutes left. So um, uh, let me just sort of um, uh, tease out a couple of the ways that I've done this in my uh, big intro to globalization course that have been really successful. One is looking at the Maharar case, not just because there's a good wealth of documents, but because it's something that students, well, I'm going to say should be engaged in, you know, like should be, uh, should be, uh, uh, should be cognizant of that. And one of the things that's super interesting about the Maharar document, in particular the factual analysis or the factual background uh, part of the report, is how much, how much objects play a role in that. It's the notes, it's the documents, it's the passport, it's the transfer of files, it's the signatures, it's all of those things that are assembled. And so as much as it is the threat print that gets constructed by it, we can say, look, it's this document moving from one place to another. And then, so the RCMP now has put in firewalls and all sorts of other things to try and separate what they consider intelligence and what they consider evidence as a response to that. And so you can get to the regulatory and you can get to the legal through these documents. But also, and I think that this links to some of the um, uh, earlier conversations we had today and last night, I think that there's a really interesting way in which those documents can tell a positive story as well. That it's Aurora's Canadian passport. However much his status is sort of ignored by the Americans, it's the passport which represents a clear claim that he can make both in Syria and then when he returns to Canada. That it's the passport that is emblematic of that sort of legitimate, uh, that legitimate authority. And it's a way for people to really sort of put those uh, different bits in perspective. So um, uh, I want to make, uh, as you can see, I think I've tried to make three basic arguments. The first is that, um, uh, that uh, actor network theory and this new materialist approach has a lot to learn from surveillance studies in terms of its political engagement and has a lot to teach. I know that uh, uh, Christy, David, and others have already talked about the promise of A&T for surveillance studies, so I hope I'm, I'm teasing that out in a way that's, um, uh, that's useful. 
Uh, secondly, I want to make the argument that problem-based learning is a really useful and engaging um, uh, pedagogy. And third, that uh, all the examples I've given give a really good prima facie evidence that using objects can be a great way to do problem-based learning in Thank you very much.